Uh, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to our second panel of the conference, which will now focus on a different topic. We addressed before the challenges for European defence, and now we will focus on building a new European defence identity. So welcome back. Um, I hope we can be as uh, brief and stick to the schedule as excellently as in the first panel. I will do my best. <laughs> So let me uh, introduce you our panelists. We will be joined by the fifth one uh, later on. So we'll start without him. Uh, right next to me, we have Daniel Fiot from the EU Institute for Security Studies. Then we have Professor Jolion Howarth. Um, he's a Jean Monnet Professor for European Politics at Personam and Emeritus Professor of European Studies at the University of Bath. Welcome. Uh, our distinguished guest in the middle is Radmila Shekirinska, uh, Vice Prime Minister and uh, Minister of Defence of the Republic of Macedonia. We are very glad you could join us. Welcome. And next to her we have um, Vice Admiral Emil Eftimov, Deputy Chief of Defence here in Bulgaria. A very warm welcome to all of you. And we will be joined later on by Ambassador Philip Rieker from the US State Department. So I suggest we'll start immediately with your presentations and especially with you, Daniel. Uh, please try to all stick to 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, I will keep watch. I will also be checking my phone, but I think we will manage it. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I hope everyone, yes, it's working. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to the conference. <coughs> First time in Sofia for me, so I feel very honored that uh, I'm here in, uh, for this conference and in such a uh, distinguished panel. Um, uh, as was rightfully said, I'm representing the EU <coughs> Institute for Security Studies, uh, which for those of you who don't know, uh, is an EU agency uh, with the task of <coughs> stimulating and supporting the reflection on the EU CFSP and CSDP. Um, let me begin my presentation by perhaps um, taking off my defense hat and trying to put on my amateur sociological hat or sociologist hat uh, to really think about what we mean uh, when we talk about the word identity. Because identity, of course, is a contested uh, uh, word, concept, and it can mean many, many things. Right? Uh, in our own personal lives, we think about uh, our own identity, sometimes our nationality, our interests, our, our you know, emotions, the myths which make up our uh, personal identity. And so, of course, to try and translate that to uh, the international level can sometimes be problematic. But as many of the speakers have already said uh, today, uh, I think it's very timely that we do indeed speak about identity. Uh, and many of the reasons have already been uh, very well elaborated, I think, in, the, in panel one. Uh, what do we mean when we speak about an EU defense identity today? Well, in terms of self-understanding, of self-critique, of our own identity and our relationship with the world, that seems to be a lot clearer uh, in the recent years. Of course, uh, we see quite clearly with the EU Global Strategy in 2016, a very uh, determined and I would say very intelligent uh, understanding of the world uh, in terms of the threats and crises which Europe faces, but also not just the strategic understanding of the world, but also where do we go? So for the first time at the EU level, I would say, we have a willingness and an ambition to move from what the High Representative and Vice President Federica Mogherini usually calls from vision to action. And of course, action is also a very important part of identity. What do we want to do in the world? So the global strategy is, is an extremely important document in terms of our understanding collectively of Europe, as Europeans. On the action side of things, also we move quite uh, much further forward. Uh, for the first time in many, many years, we say with quite a lot of confidence at the EU level that strategic autonomy should be a goal for the Europeans. Now, of course, strategic autonomy is also a contested concept. Uh, it can also be sensitive. But in, in essence, it means two things, at least in my mind. The first, Europeans have to be able to act militarily on their own, if needed, and for the obvious reasons that were discussed in panel one, but also to make the Europeans, the European Union, a much better partner for organizations and partners such as the US and, and NATO, of course. 
So that's very, very important. Uh, more on the action side of things. Uh, we don't just have a document in the global strategy, but we have, as has already been mentioned uh, this morning, a number of concrete policy uh, initiatives. Uh, the coordinated annual review on defense, uh, the European Defense Fund, I might also add, which hasn't been mentioned here, but has a, I would say, a growing significant relevance for the operational sphere, also the establishment of a command center, or the uh, so-called MPCC, the Military Planning Conduct Capability. Uh, and also lastly, uh, but not uh, uh, by no means to diminish it, permanent structured cooperation, which is also important. So we see in the space of, uh, by my calculations, 19 months since the publication of the uh, global strategy, quite clearly a move from the vision to the action. And of course I say this uh, with all of these new initiatives on the table to also say that we're still at a very early stage in many of these initiatives. Uh, the Defence Fund has already started to be used for defence research projects. So for the first time we see European money from the EU budget being used on quite sophisticated technology areas to improve um, not only the technological base in Europe, but also to improve our strategic autonomy overall. So money is flowing there into projects which should make a difference to, or put meaning into the idea of strategic autonomy. As was also said this morning, uh, we're still at a very early stage on the capability development side or the capability window of the Defence Fund. There are still negotiations uh, going on in the trialogue format. And hopefully the aim is by the beginning of next year that we have as an experimental uh, pot of money or phase uh, up to 2020, about 500 million to start investing in capability development, uh, which of course is also a major, major departure point for the European Union to start spending money on capability development. Uh, this of course all forms part of the notion of identity because uh, if I take the defense fund in particular, uh, this is not just a question about putting money on the table. It's not just a question of investing money into capabilities into research. Actually, if you look at the fund, the most important aspect of all of this is the question of strategic prioritization. Where should the money go to? What are the European priorities when it comes to research and capability development? So I would also say that uh, the question of EU defense identity, the movement from vision to action, also comes with some extremely sensitive but also interesting strategic questions which perhaps the EU has never really had to confront in the same way before. What do you want to spend your money on? Can we have an agreement between the member states on where that money should go? What is the European Union's notion of defence in the future? There was some mention uh, this morning of hybrid, of the AI revolution. We need to think seriously uh, at the EU level about what type of conflicts we could potentially be involved in in the future. Uh, would we have the political willingness uh, to engage in those types of conflicts? So overall we have, I think, at least on the question of strategic prioritization, somehow also matured with some of the new initiatives. And of course the coordinated annual review on defense is also extremely important here. Because again, we have for the first time another initiative flowing directly from the global strategy, a recognition that if strategic autonomy is to actually mean anything in reality, then the member states have to give up their past forms of behavior. And by that I mean planning only on a national basis for their defense. Uh, this clearly will not do anymore in the European Union. There's not one state that can afford now and in the future to plan on their own. So the, uh, the idea is a collective understanding of defense, a collective understanding of what capabilities we will need in the future and how we wish to fund them, and also in which conflict areas do we think the Europeans are best suited or have their key strategic interests. So this is also very, very important. And then finally on the initiatives, PESCO. What is the point of PESCO? if it doesn't lead to what the uh, treaties quite clearly articulate, is supposed to be a common defense, a European common defense policy. Uh, that clearly was not put in the treaties very, very lightly. It's a very, very ambitious goal, very, very ambitious target. I take the reading of the 25 member states that 
signed up to PESCO to mean that they understand fully the obligations that are implied with PESCO and where that may lead in the future. Now, as I said, with PESCO, we're still at a very, very early stage. You know, confidence with each other, building trust between member states, planning together, doesn't come naturally, even though we're supposed to have been doing that for many, many years. So we're entering a new phase now where uh, there is a lot of, the, at least the frameworks which we have developed should lead to this, uh, I, I dare to say the word narrowing, but a, a kind of increasing uh, unity of purpose, both on what capabilities we develop, where we're likely to be in terms of the uh, level of ambition for European defence, operationally as well, uh, and also collectively how we understand uh, our strategic environment. Now, uh, let me end with a few points uh, related again to the idea of identity. As I've said, it's about uh, you know, your self-perception, your emotions, the relationships you have with people. But of course, we all know as well that with identity, there is such thing as an identity disorder, which you know, some people can also call schizophrenia. Uh, <laughs> we also have to keep this in mind as well. I think on this basis, there are at least three forms of schizophrenia which we need to think about. Uh, the first one quite clearly relates to the relationship between the member states, the EU member states, and the EU uh, as a set of institutions and as a political project. The schizophrenia between national prerogatives and a more EU-based uh, identity or focus uh, is still not there, quite clearly. Uh, nations still plan on their own, uh, uh, largely. So the reaction is still not, even with the new initiatives, for member states to cooperate with each other. Uh, we see quite clearly in the documents a call for strategic autonomy, but I would say it is perhaps equally important to think of the notion of strategic solidarity. And this is really the core of this. Uh, what are the member states willing to do with each other in terms of their own individual, national, and even regional sometimes, uh, strategic perceptions, which can be very different, let's be honest, in the European Union. Uh, the second form of schizophrenia, which needs to be kept in mind, of course, is the NATO and EU relationship. We've had a lot of good work, I think, on uh, the joint declaration from 2016. Uh, there's quite clearly a step uh, uh, change in that relationship in terms of the uh, number of action points and working projects which have been uh, developed together by two organizations. But clearly we need to move into a phase where the relationship is comfortable, I would say, or has the space uh, for the Europeans to take up their responsibility within that relationship. And I think, as uh, Professor Biscop has already said, initiatives like PESCO are quite clearly designed not to duplicate NATO. They're actually designed for us to take up what uh, NATO has called for and even successive secretaries of defense from the US have been calling for even before President Trump's uh, entry into the White House. There's a long-term trend there, and I think we're trying to answer that call. And that didn't work in the past, and it certainly is not going to work in this uh, new world order that Sven talked about this morning, uh, an order of power transition and multipolarity, where power is back with vengeance. The second option is to pursue what we're doing now with, with PESCO, with the OHQ, with EDF, with the battle groups, all of these things that we've been talking about. But this would not amount to strategic autonomy. It would leave the European Union existentially dependent, if there were a serious threat from outside, on the United States. It would satisfy those who think we should do something more, but, it, but who don't think that Europe could or should do much more. Because at the end of the day, the identity will remain American, NATO, as the default. So the final scenario, and, and I think that this second scenario is the one we're going towards, but there's a final scenario that I put to you, uh, which those of you who've heard it before, I apologize, but I believe that if we're serious about strategic autonomy, it means ending Europe's dependency on the United States, not breaking up the alliance, but ending the state of dependency. Many Americans are calling for this. The Europeans are stand up, take responsibility for the neighborhood. Neighborhood. This is not a wild, wacky idea. This is a very, very widely thought idea in the United States. Europe should not accept the role as per permanent subcontractor to American grand strategies. If 
Europeans truly believe, as I do, that we share with the Americans core values. There is no problem in the short-term adaptation of a rebalancing within NATO. And my heretical argument is that this should be done through NATO and not in contradistinction to NATO. There were many reasons why ESDP, CSDP should have been founded at the turn of the century and was, didn't work. There are no longer the reasons for keeping these two things totally distinctive. Trying to find something to do that NATO isn't doing. This doesn't make any sense. So I believe that we should do it and we should aim for the Europeanization of NATO en bonne intelligence with the Americans talking all the time about how we can rebalance the, the, the responsibilities and leadership within the United, within, uh, within, the, within the Atlantic Alliance. So, and to emerge really as equal partners, because that is manifestly in the interests of the United States, just as is in the interests of the European Union. Now, I was asked to talk about Brexit for a few minutes. It takes far too long. Um, I will, uh, if, if there's a question about Brexit, that's fine. I believe that the EU and the UK will come to some sort of cooperative working arrangement, but I think that in terms of the decision about European defense identity, this is a decision that the Europeans should make and not be constantly thinking about how the UK may or may not fit into this. Once Europeans have decided which way they want to go, then we can talk to the Brits. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Professor Howarth, for this very passionate and rather pessimistic presentation, I might no, say. <laughs> okay, then. It's the only way to go. Um, no, I completely agree with you. Uh, now we move on uh, with our guest, uh, Vice Prime Minister. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, when you're invited to speak about identity, especially in this part of the world, you know, it, it, grow, it, it uh, creates too many parallels and links to the past. So this is actually a very, a very uh, visible change. You know, we are talking about identities that shape the future and not identities shaped by our past. And it's a, it's a welcome change after being uh, stuck in a discussion about identities for too many years in, in this region. Uh, I will uh, start uh, by saying that I sit at a different uh, chair compared to the other two, two uh, participants in the discussion. Uh, I come from a country that, I dare to say, benefited with all the weaknesses from the common security and foreign policy, and probably was one of the successes among other maybe failures or, 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 or uh, less visible successes. And uh, for me, uh, as, as someone coming from this region, from a country struggling uh, to start accession talks with the EU, the sooner the better, country struggling uh, after a 10 year delay to get an invitation for NATO. For me, uh, reading some of the, the, the statements after the, the new strategy, uh, where several people have insisted that uh, in order to develop this new defense EU uh, identity, uh, the European Union has to present its, itself as a credible power on the global scene, which will be rational, wise, and calm. I thought that it was a good uh, summary. I, I have to say that I missed one, one word, maybe it was uh, there in the title. You know, power with strategic decision making is what I think needs to be uh, repeated again and again. Because uh, the strategic um, autonomy is one thing, but the being able to act, being able to make the decisions with this strategic goal in mind, I think offers, uh, offers an added value uh, to the EU. Uh, in order for the European Union to become a successful, um, or at least a global player, as, as you have referred to, it has to be already a successful regional player. And, uh, I believe that there is still some work to be done there. Uh, I, I, I endorse the view that uh, the, the enlargement was uh, sometimes pushed more by the newcomers than actually by, by the decision makers in the EU. Uh, but it was a successful uh, strategy and it did provide for an additional security on the continent. So it actually met the, the criteria, it met the, 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 the reasoning behind it. 
And uh, the positive uh, changes uh, recently with the renewed focus on the Western Balkans, I think are, are the step in the right direction. What we have seen after several years of very strong words by key European officials that enlargement has to be put on you know, a side track, it has to be prolonged, it, you know, Europe needs a strategic pause, uh, they were not only detrimental to parts of the European continent, that they were detrimental to building this uh, new sense of not only responsibility but power and active approach vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the continent itself. Uh, so uh, let me say that uh, what we have seen, not only lately, but also many years ago, uh, were concrete evidence on how EU can be more active and more decisive, but also how the cooperation with NATO can act smoothly if there are good discussions and uh, shared interests. And I will have to say that in Macedonia, this is why I started there, Macedonia was such an example back in 2001. Is, is not uh, rooted in the United States' desire to do less, uh, but rather, I think, in an overall recognition that our allies and, and partners have serious capabilities and know-how to address the ever-evolving complexities of the European security environment. And I think it really is, uh, while a challenge politically, financially, obviously, um, it also represents a real opportunity for European countries um, in that with U.S. Uh, support, European countries can make available capabilities and platforms to influence the shape uh, and identity of their own security environment. So for that reason, uh, the United States fully supports uh, enhanced European defense initiatives like PESCO. Uh, I was at the Munich Security Conference and there was a lot of whispering behind the, the scenes. Uh, were the Americans uh, upset by PESCO? Where did they think? In fact, uh, General Scaparati and I were having dinner the other night and, and he said, you know, this is what we've been encouraging Europe to do for 40 years, more. Uh, this kind of uh, permanent structured cooperation. Uh, and of course, uh, the underlying assumption uh, uh, not even a caveat, but, but the basis to that is that such projects, like PESCO and other initiatives, seek to complement rather than duplicate uh, existing NATO capabilities and structures. Um, obviously, a lot of these initiatives uh, in PESCO are still at, at very nation stages, but uh, based on a lot of conversations I've had at Brussels, uh, the engagement of our uh, U.S. mission to the European Union, which works very closely with the U.S. mission to NATO, to try to engage broadly and, and understand uh, and offer uh, support and input on these initiatives. Um, I think there's really a cause for, for optimism. Um, there's widespread understanding still, and I think we're hearing it on this panel today too, that while um, collective defense per se um, is a NATO mission, uh, that many of the emerging security issues across the theater and frankly globally should be addressed jointly by NATO and the European Union in various formats. This includes issues like cyber, uh, the hybrid threats, terrorism, uh, and military mobility, a topic that has uh, a significant amount of uh, focus these days uh, at European Command uh, and in Brussels uh, and individual capitals where we are focused on the need to update infrastructure to allow us to move uh, military equipment, resupply uh, for exercises obviously, but to be prepared uh, for the potential needs. Uh, and the fact that the EU is stepping up to the plate, uh, engaging in this way uh, should be welcomed. And uh, part of our job is to educate back to Washington uh, from the military command, from our embassies, to help uh, Congress uh, and ultimately the American public understand what Europe is doing uh, and contributing. Uh, and being careful to emphasize that the EU efforts uh, should be and in fact are uh, coordinated with uh, 
uh, and supportive uh, of NATO efforts and capability targets. Um, but it really is a, a window of opportunity for European countries. Um, it's an opportunity to uh, together develop new technologies, to develop new ways of doing things. Um, and I think it's, it's quite symbolic uh, in many ways that it's sort of 75 years this year uh, since US troops came to Europe or came back to Europe, a, a country that was founded in many ways on uh, European ideals um, with uh, people from across Europe as well as uh, other parts of the world who came to Europe 100 years ago for the First World War and helped end that and then left. And when we were brought back uh, with the Second World War, uh, landing uh, 75 years ago this, this year uh, in Italy uh, for Sicily and the Italian campaign, and you, and you all know the history, we realized that we needed to stay. And we needed to work with European partners to develop a series of institutions, uh, a series of rules, uh, and it's, it's the Euro-Atlantic, transatlantic, uh, structures that have allowed us to live uh, in an unprecedented period of uh, peace on this continent, uh, which has, of course, given us an opening to an unprecedented level of, of prosperity. Um, and so 75 years on from that, from what one might say, the, the founding of U.S. European Command when U.S. troops arrived uh, on the continent, um, we're still there. We're still headquartered in, in Stuttgart. We're still very much engaged in this, but we very much also welcome uh, the new efforts uh, to expand and shape uh, an identity for European and transatlantic security uh, that fits the 21st century. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll stop and say thank you again for the, the opportunity to be back here. Look forward to the question. Thank you very much, Ambassador Ricker, and we'll move straight on to our final guest of the second panel. <coughs> Vice Admiral, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Madam Minister, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me first thank uh, the organizers for inviting me and uh, just giving me an opportunity to briefly touch upon on Bulgaria Airforce's uh, approach to building uh, sustainable During this conference in Bulgaria, I was advised by the organizers to speak in Bulgaria, and I'm going to do so. But then, in my Q and A session, uh, I may speak uh, in English or in English. So, Bulgaria has a very strong NATO and European presence. It's a very complex, very complex engagement. Engagement of the responsibility to be the first of the Battle of Syria, the Battle of the Battle of the Engagement is the first of the standards that are allowed in the format of the CNC. And this is the first of the CNC. And this is the first of the CNC. In the last moment, the CNC was the first of the CNC. And the CNC was the first of the CNC. And the CNC was the first of the CNC. Беше направен анализ на конфликтован техничен състав, развитието на проектите за модернизация, ограничените финансови ресурси и изменената държава сигурност. Изпълнение на тези ангажименти, в началото на 2018 година Министерски съвет на Република България прие национален план за достигане на разпит до отправна за 2% от брутния вътрешен продукт от 2024 година, което поставя нови предизвикателства пред планирането на въоръжените сили. Това решение беше отчетено от страна на фактурите като положителна стъпка за развитието на отреконите способности на България. В рамките на бюджета на отбраза ние се стремим да предлагаме комплексен подход в използване на възможности на механизми на сътрудничество и участие в инициативи и проекти за изграждане на необходимите способности. По-наташното си изложение ще се струна Процесът на изграждане на способностите, поливане на НАТО, Европейския съюз и двустранното сътрудничество. 
Полина на НАТО. Полина на НАТО, говорим за две основни направления. Това е участване в проекти срещу инициативата Интелигентна охрана или Smart Defense. По-настоящем участваме в 24 проекта, разделени в три подгрупи. Процесът на планирана охрана на НАТО или НДПП е другия и основен механизъм за постигане на необходимите отбранителни способности. Той осигурява рамката, с която се гармонизира националното отбранително планиране и процеса на планирана отбраната на Альянса, като помага изграждането и предоставянето на необходимите сили и способности за участие в пълния спектър на мисли и операция на Альянса. Тоест, изпълнявайки, давайки възможност да се изпълни нивото има амбиция на Альянса. В момента изпълняваме пакет, прехни изпълняваме до почти на изпълнението на проект Сили 2017. Има естествено приемственост с третия пакет Сили 2013 година, като фокуса в новия пакет се поставя върху изпълнението на операции за колективна отбрана и воря на бойни действия с високи интенситет. Това е естествено новия във връзка с изменената среда за сигурност. В този процес приоритетите за България са изграждането на тежка механизирана бригада, хеви механайз бриги и развитието и усъвършенстването на морската ситуационна осведоменност. По изграждане на способности с механизмите на Европейския съюз. През тяхната година бяха предприяти и реализите стъпки на европейско ново по практическо изпълнение на приоритетите, практически от новата глобална стратегия на Европейския съюз. Заместник министр за правото ме информира в Петрохинов спикер за основните моменти в политиката на България. По отношение на военните аспекти и нашето участие в формулирането и развитие на тази политика, ние подкрепихме създаването на новата структура на военния секретарят на Европейския съюз за планира и провеждане на военни мисли на стратегическо ниво. Military Planning and Standard Capability. Считаме, че така ще се осигури своевременно планиране и ръководство на този тип военно-тренировачни мисли, което липсваше до момента и натоварваше командирите от оперативното ниво. Също така приветствам на решението на съвета на Европейския съюз за координиране на различния проект на отбраната и карта. Възприемаме този механизъм като средство за систематичен обмен на информация по отношение на отборителното планиране и изпълнение на плана за развитие на способности. Подкрепваме също възприятия подход да не създава допълнителна администрация, като също време много считаме, че трябва да се запази в максимална степен синхронизирането на дейности с процеса на отбранителното планиране в НАТО. Участване в ПЕСКО е в рамките на националното ниво на амбиция и налични ресурси, което към момент се изглежда за времето желание за участие в следните основни проекти. Network of Logistic Clubs in Europe and Support Operations, Military Mobility and Upgrade of Maritime Surveillance както може да направите връзка с което се отложи във изглушение, с това е в директна връзка с процесите в НАТО. Един от приоритетите, по който България се учи усилите си, е стратегическа необходимост за сила на военната мобилност. Както казах, това съвпада с целите на Европейския съюз и е фундаментално изискване на НАТО за своевременно разрушите на силите в много висока степен на готовност в зоната на отговорност на командващия театър. Именно този пакт обослови високия интерес на политическото и военно ръководство за постигане на предък в областта на военната мобилност. По нашия национален принос към по-натачно развитие на концепция за бърз отговор на Европейски съюз и бойните групи на Европейски съюз, участваме активно в бойна група Хелброк, водеща страна Гърция и с участие на Кипър, Румъния и Украина. Групата в момента е на джижурство, Първото полугоре на 2018 година. Считаме, че бойните групи на Европейския съюз са важен инструмент за бърз отговор на Европейския съюз под кризи. Подкрепяме усилията за оптимизиране на условията за тяхното използване. Разширяването на възможност за общото финансиране на бойните групи ще стимулира тяхното използване, с което ще се издигне и ролята им за постигане на заявяното ниво на амбиция на Европейския съюз. По отношение на приноса ни към мисия и операции на Европейския съюз, Имаме основен ангажимент в операция Алтея, където поддържаме готовно строство Вижина Резерв и в момента има действащата ми офицери в щаба на силите в Сараево. Участваме в наблюдателната мисия в Грузия, Мали, Аталанта, Юпол, Афганистан, 
Юна Порвет, където е нищо да от цели. Укрепването на сигурността и свободността в Западните Балкани са част от приоритетите на българското председател. В тази връзка България е заинтересована от ефективното използване на военните сили и средства на операция Алтия, като фактор за поддържане на сигурността, сейфенси и кърпоназване на района. Считаме, че трябва да се използва всяка възможност за координиране на стратегически послания, съвместно между НАТО и Европейския съюз и провеждане на съгласуване действия по изграждане на капацитет и устойчивост на Западните Балкани. По нататъчното си изложение имам информация относно проекти от портфолиото на Европейската агенция по отбрана и Европейската програма за индивидуално за индивидуал защита на здравна отбрана. Искам да се повтаря, но ще се позволя, използвайки, така да се каже, академик Климан в Фридон в време на конференцията. Manage this particular challenge. I'm not going to go through it because it would take too long, but uh, it is something that we can no longer afford to ignore. Um, having said that, I do believe that um, the fate of humanity depends on our getting the non proliferation thing correct. I am a strong believer in global zero. I believed that President Obama was a strong believer in global zero, but he changed towards the end of his uh, mandate, and we are in a critical situation right now. I, I just point out um, that on the issue of, of nuclear threat, obviously, as you mentioned, uh, the United States is very engaged Iran issue and the North Korea issue and on uh, non-proliferation more broadly, uh, including in, in uh, counterterrorism efforts and the concerns there uh, about nuclear as well as uh, uh, other weapons of, of mass destruction, chemical, uh, that we've seen very recently. But we recently released uh, the nuclear um, uh, review, the uh, um, uh, nuclear posture review, uh, which was a, a first and a, and a new and important document which wasn't perhaps widely understood or well reported on as, as these technical things can often be, but I would commend to you uh, reading the review. It's, it's in a fairly, uh, uh, even I could understand it, so it's fairly uh, basic. And it was something that uh, we found as we briefed uh, allies uh, on the review uh, about our nuclear posture. Um, they welcome, they welcome the, the openness, the transparency, the discussion about it. If I could sum it up, I think the view is, look, nuclear weapons are part of our arsenal. They're part of, of deterrence. Uh, they're there, and so we want to make sure uh, that, that the posture of them has, has been reviewed and, and updated and, and modernized uh, to, the, to the appropriate uh, level. You know, this is, many of these weapons have been around for a long, long time. And part of what President Trump has actually uh, looked at, or his administration, is just reviewing and making sure that, that our nuclear posture, our nuclear deterrent, is, is appropriate, is, uh, is not outdated, uh, because it is a part of, of our arsenal and our, our strategy. Uh, so I just commend to you that, uh, that report, as I think it's, it's useful to read and, and sort of enlightening. Thank you. Uh, because we're running out of time, maybe one or two very brief questions. Uh, the lady in the back, please. Hello, my name is Genka Gurgiev. I'm uh, the director of EU policies and institutions in the foreign ministry. Thank you for the, my, for the invitation uh, to me to participate in this event. And as Bulgaria is now in the role of the rotating presidency, of the Council, my question is linked to one of our priorities, the Western Balkans. Um, we have been arguing that the Western Balkans is an indispensable part of the new uh, European uh, project, and how do you see the inclusion of the Western Balkans in this new EU defense identity? Through new projects, opening projects for them, through the battle groups, uh, through more training and dialogue, just some of the ideas that we have been discussing in the foreign ministry. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Anyone would like to start with an answer? Uh, well, it's, uh, I would just reiterate what I was saying. I think maybe the others could, could add some more, more detail. Uh, we, we, uh, let me say how much we appreciate uh, the fact that the Bulgarian presidency has turned uh, Western Balkans as one of their priorities. It makes sense, <laughs> regardless of how you, you look at it, strategically, regionally, uh, politically. And uh, it did have a certain effect. Uh, yes, the focus was predominantly in other areas, uh, but you know the good thing about being uh, about lagging behind is that you can change a bit uh, easier to the changing environment. So if, if there is more of a defense cooperation within the European Union, I think that the countries uh, that were slower uh, in terms of integration uh, might be able to be the first. Uh, in, in adjusting, and uh, we have worked very hard, uh, of course, with, with some of the EU member states on improving our interoperability within NATO, but uh, actually the more you talk uh, with EU member states as well about training, about um, joint threats, uh, the more we see that there, there are parallels, and uh, we have been uh, very active also in the area of regional cooperation because uh, we, we see that uh, there is no reason to, to talk about you know, the role of the EU in dealing with the Balkans, the responsibility of the EU, and then to forget your own responsibility to, to, to uh, try and increase the links and the cooperation uh, within the region. And I, I, I do believe that uh, especially some of the countries in the Balkans have managed to show a different identity in foreign relations as well uh, that hasn't been typical uh, towards the Balkan, and I will commend uh, the agreement between Bulgaria and Macedonia. And uh, uh, I have to say that we have managed uh, in less than two months of negotiations to show that the two countries can act in a very European way and try to bridge differences that we have been struggling with for years and which have made our relationship in many areas, including defense, very difficult. Uh, starting from the agreement that was reached last year, in, in less than several months, we have uh, increased our trade, if I'm not mistaken, 15%. We have increased our level of defense cooperation on trainings, especially in equipment that we actually share. It's old, it, can, it, should be, it should be renewed, it should be modernized, but while we are having it, we might as well profit from sharing some of the capabilities. And uh, we have moved very much on, on uh, having joint uh, training uh, and exercises. So uh, we believe the time has come not only for you to embrace the region, but also the region to embrace its own responsibility. Thank you very much. And a very last question from the gentleman. Okay, Colonel Dur, uh, former head of a section in NATO structure and current uh, Turkish military attaché. Just my question will be quite brief about the uh, possible uh, focus of EU defense identity as uh, uh, from a, a decision making perspective, uh, whether focusing uh, on protective, preventative, proactive uh, measurement, focusing on uh, monitoring the possible problematic area and uh, interfere uh, before they turn into a real problem or uh, interfere uh, with, uh, with the problem as they arise uh, getting a, uh, a bigger problem uh, and getting higher uh, risk for the security of the uh, region. Of course, uh, both are equally important, but uh, in, from my perspective, focus should be on one of them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the question is for everyone, or do you prefer specific? Actually, for those who, who believe about defense identity. Mm -hmm. Focusing on preventative, proactive measurement in order to monitor and detect the problematic area and interfere before they in turn into a real problem for the security of the region or uh, uh, interfere the uh, 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 crisis we understood it. It's, after it's it arises and be a real problem for the security of the region. Of Thank course, you. they are both equally important. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Um, we agree. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, conflict prevention is in the DNA of the European Union. I mean, the whole point about right. CSDP, and if you look at the CSDP structures, they're predominantly geared to conflict prevention. So it's about early warning, um, 
diploma, diplomacy, uh, first and foremost. But of course, I mean, I don't think you have a serious, you're not a serious defense actor unless you're prepared, first of all, to engage in prevention. And as I said, if you read every document, if you look at most of the work that's con uh, continued by inst various institutions in Brussels at the EU level, even there in their DNA, it's all about conflict prevention. Of course, we understand the logic very, very well. It's better to deal with a crisis if you can before it, it turns into a full-blown crisis. Sometimes it's successful, sometimes not. But the general point of it being in the, in the, the DNA of the European Union, I think, is, is uh, undisputable. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And with this final statement, I'm going to close the second panel, the second session of today's conference.